Thank you, uh, and thanks to VMware and Women Transforming Technology for having me here today. I'm really excited to be talking about uh, Scribd's journey over the past two years um, to make our site and our web app fully accessible. So a little bit about me. Um, as you mentioned, uh, my name is Sue Ray. I'm a software engineer at Scribd. I love React. We build on Ruby on Rails. I also love learning new languages. And my new passion, aside from archery, is planting trees. So what is Scribd? Who here knows or has heard of Scribd? All right, a handful of you. Probably most of you know us as a platform for PDFs and PDF hosting. Um, we also are a subscription service for ebooks, audiobooks, magazines, and news articles. So you basically have an entire library on the app in your pocket, unlimited uh, access to all of our documents. Uh, we have over 800,000 paying subscribers right now and 130 employees, and we're quickly growing. So to give a little background about what started Scribd on our accessibility journey, uh, in 2014, our site looked something like this. Uh, if you had used it a few years ago, you might recognize some of the branding and the look of it. Then we got sued. So we got sued by the Federation for the Blind, um, and as part of, we were found to be violating American with Disabilities Act in terms of not enabling uh, people with disabilities to access our site, especially because we were hosting audiobooks and reading material that was especially important for people with visual, hearing, and dexterity impairments. Um, we needed to get our act together and make our site fully accessible so that all users could access that information and not be blocked off. Uh, so we were given two years to make our entire web app fully accessible, and that meant we hired lots more devs in QA to start this process. We had staff dedicated exclusively to accessibility. We did a company-wide education and training about what it means to be a user with disabilities and uh, how they interact with the web, not just our site, but the web in general. Um, and within two years, I'm happy to say, we did make our site fully accessible. I'm going to kind of walk through some of the technical side of what we did. So let's get to work. Now, before we get started with what sort of tooling we built on our site to, to make sure that people with different disabilities were able to use it, I wanted to go over really quickly uh, what kind of users um, interact with the web that we might not think about in our daily lives when we're coding or when we're building our our sites and our apps. Um, so there are a lot of people who can't just open up a computer, type on the keyboard, use their mouse, and uh, use websites the way that maybe a lot of us in here do. Uh, they need assistive technologies. And some of the four main assistive technologies that people use when uh, navigating the web are screen readers. Uh, and as you might guess, that's something that just reads off what's on the page and tells somebody with visual impairments like what is actually there. There's also high contrast screens for people with low vision or um, color blindness. You can't see certain colors on top of other colors. Uh, they also use keyboard navigation. Um, oh wait, so let me just go through really quick. So these are screen readers. That's Apple VoiceOver that's built into all of our Macs. And when a site is reading uh, a page, it sort of looks like that. It, it's speaking this into your headphones or your speakers, and you also have that visual representation of what's being read. This is what users using a high contrast screen will see when they turn it on. So you'll notice a lot of the colors get washed out, and your colors need to have high contrast for, for these um, high contrast extensions to be able to pick up on anything. OK, so then back to keyboard navigation. A lot of people with motor impairments, dexterity uh, impairments, can't use a mouse the way that we can. Uh, you know, things that we take for granted when you're clicking around on a mouse or hovering over things, they have to do with a keyboard. And we'll go over that in a little bit more detail. And then people use uh, screen magnifiers and text zoom if they have low vision as well. And you'll see, like, for example, there are a lot of sites that aren't exactly optimized for uh, being zoomed in on. And so it's really hard to read if you zoom in on something and you haven't built your site to be able to accommodate for that. So I went through some of the assistive technologies, and just after hearing that, we realized our site had a lot of problems. And I'm going to go over eight of them, if I have enough time. 
uh, that were the main challenges that we faced. Some of them were low-hanging fruit, really easy to resolve, relatively speaking, and some of them uh, took our entire team to sort of get together and figure out how we were going to solve that. Um, so, these are the problems I'm going to go through. I'll read them now. So, problem number one. We had divs all over our site, divs and spans. It was a div soup. And this is an issue because semantic markup, which is a part of HTML5, was created to help screen readers and keyboard navigators uh, understand the layout of the site. Uh, is anyone here familiar with semantic markup or HTML5 elements, things like main, uh, aside, footer, header? Uh, rather than using divs or spans, these things help give an idea of the structure of the page. But we had recently converted to React. We thought it was so great. And the magic of React is that you can wrap everything in a div and a span and still make it a button or still make it a heading. Um, and it was really convenient. So we were creating headers like that with class name header and applying header styling with CSS. Or we were creating divs that were considered buttons because we attached a click handler to that. The issue with that was that as you're navigating uh, with the keyboard through the site, those buttons would not be highlighted because they're not considered actual buttons, right? So there would be no way for somebody using a keyboard to actually be able to click on that thing and access that click handler that we attached. The solution to this was relatively simple. We went through our entire site, did a massive site audit, and uh, fixed up all of our HTML to be semantic markup. So anything that was supposed to be a button, we made into a button. Uh, anything that was supposed to be a header, we applied the header element to it. And if for browsers that weren't equipped to handle HTML5, we would just add this role, uh, which sort of doubled as, um, as like a HTML5 semantic element. So the screen reader was still able to understand it, even if it was a div, as long as it had role header or role um, footer or something, it understood what it meant. So that was pretty easy. That took maybe a few months of work. Uh, site number two, or problem number two, our site was not readable by screen readers. And that was sort of solved with the HTML5 semantic markup solution. But, and this might be something that your own web apps face, we had a lot of stuff on our page where we took for granted that people could understand what an image was. And, you know, that's a button because it's an icon. Like, for example, our document cells had this little bookmark icon, and that means you can save that to your library. But if you can imagine somebody who can't see that icon, uh, how are they supposed to know that there's a button there that they can save this document to their library? Uh, another issue was that our images didn't all have alt text on them, which means, again, a screen reader doesn't know what's there. And if it's an image that's important for a user to understand what's on the page, we need to add those in. Uh, and a few other issues, for example, with hover dialogues and tool tips that are triggered on hover, again, a screen reader has a hard time knowing something is there and something has changed. So our solution, take all the images off my slide. Uh, okay, there are actually, what happened? Oh, they're back, okay. So one of the solutions was first we labeled everything. So any form inputs, we added a label to it. Any images, we add alt text to them. And then we also created a, something called a visually hidden class. And that's totally done with CSS. But what it allows us to do is add spans that have text that a screen reader can read, but that a user can't see if they're just looking at the page. Uh, and that gives some more uh, contextual uh, information about what is going on for screen readers. So for example, now that same save button, if you actually look at what's on the DOM, right under that button, so this is the button, right? But right under that, there's a span that says remove from saved. And that's in this class called visually hidden. And so what visually hidden looks like is this. It's basically a borderless one pixel by one pixel span. Uh, where we push the margin off by negative one pixel, so the text is outside of the actual span, uh, and it's overflow hidden, so you can't see what the text is. Uh, and how we applied that is here. Uh, we add that save for later span, apply the class visually hidden, that's right under our save button, and now the screen reader can see it. And I apologize if anyone has a hard time reading the code on this screen, how ironic that I couldn't make it 
more visible, but that's the best I could do. Uh, so problem number three, font colors were hard to read, and that was a problem that I mentioned with color contrast. When you use those high contrast screens, um, if you have white on gray or something, that does not get picked up. That just gets uh, washed out into a big white blob. So this is what our site looked like before. It's hard to read even as a user without uh, any dis visual impairment, much less if you're going to be using a high contrast screen reader or if you just have low vision. So our solution to that, rebrand our entire site. So something that was pretty cool that Scribd did was we were like, yeah, this is a big issue with the kind of colors we chose back in the 90s. And maybe we should start thinking about like rebranding everything so that all our color uh, branding helps people with low vision or who need high contrast screens. So we did that. We chose our entire color palette based on what met the standards and criteria for color contrast for visual impairments. Uh, and the result was pretty awesome because thanks to that rebrand, our site now popped more, uh, even for people without low vision. And uh, it just looked fresher and better. So this actually was a huge opportunity for us. The reason, the motivating factor was um, trying to make our site accessible, but the end result was that our site got a facelift and we saw user engagement increase in significantly after this rebrand. All right, so those are all sort of low hanging fruits. They involve kind of just swapping out HTML elements, changing some CSS, but then we got into some trickier things like focus. So this is focus. <laughs> but also that focus. So does anyone know what focus indicators are on a site? Or has anyone been filling out a form and then rather than reaching for the mouse, they just press tab and go to the next button, right? And you can just press enter. So that blue box is a focus indicator and that allows keyboard users to navigate the site just by pressing tab or shift tab or up and down keys, right? Then you can go through all the buttons and then just use your return key to click on something. Uh, keyboard navigation uses that focus indicator, indicator to know what users can interact with. For us, that was a big issue because we had stuff that was popping up in the middle of the page and suddenly you're tabbing through it, but it's, your focus is jumping all over the place or it's coming out of your light box. Uh, we had button menus where keyboard navigation doesn't work as expected. Um, again, we had those custom clickable divs and spans where focus wasn't landing on it properly. And some other issues were, you know, we style things for hover effects, right? When you hover over it, opacity becomes 0.5. But we don't take into account that when people are focusing, they expect that same sort of effect. So uh, that wasn't being taken into consideration when we were writing our style sheets. Uh, we also had issues where focus order didn't match the page layout. So earlier uh, in our page design, we would style things so that in the markup, it goes like header, image, body, content, but the image would actually be on the bottom of the page and we we're positioning that absolutely with CSS. And it looks fine for regular users, but as you're tabbing through, your focus indicator is like jumping all over the place on the page and it's really hard to know where the focus indicator is, to know where you are, uh, and it's pretty disorienting for users that are using keyboard navigation. And then the one other thing was with React, it was really easy to remove, add and remove things on the DOM on the fly without causing a reload. And every time something was removed from the DOM, the focus got reset to the body of the page. So it just went all the way back to the corner. So you're tabbing through and then you close the light box and you expect it to be where you were before, but instead now you're back at the header, you gotta like tab over a million times before you can get back to where you were. So these are all things we never think about, but when you're trying to use the site uh, with keyboard, it gets really annoying and really frustrating. So we had to apply both HTML, CSS, but especially a lot of JavaScript solutions for solving these, uh, this focus management issue. Uh, the easy stuff with HTML and CSS was that we made hover and focus states equivalent uh, in our style sheets and made sure those matched. For any button that shouldn't be clickable by a user, if we have like a hidden form element, a hidden submit button or something like that, that we apply tab index equals negative one to that and that means focus will skip over it. And we made our source order match the visual page layout. So no more absolute positioning with CSS and things like that if it threw off our page layout. 
But what I want to talk in more detail about is our JavaScript that we wrote. Uh, we had three different things that we wrote custom for this. We did a trap focus in children, which basically when you create a pop-up modal or, some, or a button menu, it allows the focus to just cycle within that container. It doesn't escape it. Then fo focusable children, which I'll go in a little detail. Uh, and then we built our own custom focus indicator. So first, let's go over pop-ups and modals. What is the problem there? Like I said, focus needs to cycle within that container until the user decides to exit it, either with the escape key or clicking the close button on the container. Shift key is supposed to make keyboard navigation go backwards. So if you hold that down and then press tab, it should go back. And then after you close something that's popped up, your focus needs to go back to what opened it in the first place or the last element you were on. It shouldn't go back to the body, like I mentioned, usually happens. So this is what our site looked like before. Uh, so this is our focus indicator, this green rectangle. And so you open this modal, that's great. You're focusing, you're tabbing through, and then you're expecting it to go back up. You're like, all right, I don't want to create a list. I want to name the list, but instead, your focus goes all the way down to the footer, and now you're like moving down randomly. How do you get back there? You like, can't even figure it out. So what we did, and this code is CoffeeScript. So if anyone's familiar with that, it's sort of an amalgam of Python and JavaScript. And um, as the introducer mentioned, I was part of a big effort to move us off of CoffeeScript into ES6 JavaScript. But this was sort of lifted right out of our code um, that we haven't converted yet. So if anyone has questions about the syntax, I'm happy to answer them. But basically, when a light box opens, first we want to store the last thing that the focus was on before it was opened. And we store that in a global variable called last focused element. And then we want to move our focus to the container. And that's a jQuery object. This can also be done with vanilla JavaScript. But dot focus is a JavaScript uh, API that allows the focus indicator to go onto that uh, DOM element. So we store the last focused element, and then we focus on the container of the light box, and now the user can tab through that. Then we call this function called trap focus in children, which I'll go over in a little bit more detail. Uh, but before I do that, on once you close the light box, you click a close button or you click outside of it, we want to focus back onto the thing we stored as last focused element. And then we apply aria hidden true to the light box because we no longer want the screen reader to read that it's still on the page. So how does trap focus children or trap focus in children work? Basically, we grab all the focusable children on that jQuery element, and that's here. Basically, anything with uh, an anchor tag, a button tag, is considered an input or has a tab index. And we store that as an array. So anything within that jQuery element that you want to trap focus in, it goes through and grabs all the things that are able to be focused on. Uh, and then we make sure that they don't have a visually hidden or a skip focus class on them. Because if they do, we don't want our focus indicator to go on there. And then this is some memoization for performance. So we'll go through that. And then that returns an array of all the things that can be focused on within our container. Then we go back to trap focus in children. And then we track whether or not where the focus is on the document and whether or not the user is pressing a key at any point in time. And then we add some functions for if a user is pressing a shift key and they happen to be on the first element in that container, they press shift and then tab, that should bring them to the last element of the container. It shouldn't take them out of the container. It needs to take them to the last element. And similarly, if they are on the last element, unless they press shift key, that needs to, if they press tab again, it needs to go back to the first element in that container. And so that's where we call this. Those functions that we defined earlier, if you're on the first one and then you change the focus by pressing tab, you want to call focus last, which again checks if you're doing a shift key. If yes, focus on the last one. If no, just go as like default behavior, go to the next element. And if you're on the last one, you want to make sure that unless you're clicking the shift key, it goes back to the first element. So now when we open the modal, we'll see that no matter how much you 
press tab, it just stays in there until you press the close button. Uh, similarly, we did something similar with uh, drop down menus. This one was a little bit more complicated because you wanted to add different functions for whether or not you're pressing up or down keys. With drop down menus, up makes you go up, uh, the menu down makes you go down, and then tab will bring you out of that container. So again, this is what it looked like before. Just kind of goes out, keeps the thing open, it looks really ugly. And then we, this, for this one, we used uh, React's lifecycle methods to enable us to track, okay, is this button menu open right now? If so, then we want to make sure up and down keys go through it and tab escapes it and closes that menu. And if not, um, and if it's closed, then we want to refocus on the button that opened it in the first place. And so we did a lot of key bindings. For different keys, we had different functions and different things that the, the component should be focused on. And then also with tab, depending on whether or not they're holding down the shift key or not, it will hide the menu or it'll open it. And so now, if we're going down, we're going down. If we go up, it goes up. Or if we click up, click down. And if we click escape, focus goes back onto the original button that opened it. If we press tab, it goes down and it also escapes it and then closes the other menu. So these are all things that React actually helped us a lot um, with doing because we could use component did update and check where's the focus every time something's changing on the page. Uh, is the menu open or is it closed? And basically manage focus that way through React and JavaScript's focus caller. And then here's a little bit about how we did our own custom focus indicator. Basically, we added a special class called keyboard focus. If we detect the users using a keyboard, then anything that's focused gets that green rectangle. And one of the reasons we did that is because different browsers and different accessibility technologies manage focus differently. And we would find that, sure, we're calling focus here. We put tab index on this element, and it works on Chrome, but it doesn't work on IE11 or doesn't work um, with uh, a screen reader of a certain brand. So by making our own focus indicator, we can make sure that what we expect to be focused will be focused uh, for the user, regardless of what technology they're using or what platform they're using. So the other thing, uh, I keep mentioning React, and it's really great for our app. It makes things really fast. You don't have to reload every time there's a change on the page. Uh, and it's awesome for ordinary browsers, but it definitely keeps assistive technology users in the dark. And what I mean by that is, for example, our, this footer bar on our ebook reader is a React component, and it manages what page you're on, what percentage you've read, how many pages are left in the chapter through its state. So you're clicking through, and it's updating that footer as you go through without reloading the page. But how is a screen reader supposed to know that you're on a different page now? So our solution, we created an ARIA live region, which is a sort of HTML element that's specifically meant to tell a screen reader if something's been updated on your page. And then we attach a message to it, and we update that message continuously if something's changed. And so we had this function that basically creates that live region or checks if, something, if that live region already exists on the DOM. And then we update the text within it by passing it into that function. So the function takes text, and it takes an identifier if you want it on a specific ARIA live region. And then how we, did the, how we used it in the footer, there is a function called get ARIA live text. And what that'll do is take, all right, what's our page count? What's the percentage? What's the pages remaining? All the strings. We concatenate the strings, and that creates a sentence about, uh, that sort of describes the changes that are described in that footer. And then on component did update again, we will compare our new ARIA text with what was stored in the previous state of ARIA text. If they're different, then we know to call that helper function that we made that updates the text. And so what that looks like is you'll see here there's a span ARIA Live set to polite, which means that it won't interrupt the screen reader if it's in the middle of something, but it'll announce any changes after everything else has been read. And when we click through, it changes that string. And so the screen reader is reading the updates of the pages as you, as you flip through. OK. So 
Uh, another problem I'll talk about really quickly, we had our audiobook, once you land on the audiobook page, it starts auto-playing the audiobook immediately. And that's really disorienting for readers, especially who are using screen readers, because you have this book being blaring at you, and then you're like trying to pause it, but you've got to like tab through everything before you can find where the pause button is. So what we did was cr we created a hidden pause button on the top. So if the user presses tab, the first thing they land on is a pause button. So that's this visually hidden element on the top. Problem number seven, what about phones and tablets? Those need to be accessible too. People with uh, disabilities use those all the time. So should we also com convert all their iOS and Android apps to be fully accessible in two years? <sighs> We're gonna have to hire a lot more people. Uh, okay, instead we just made our entire site web responsive, or mobile web responsive. And that was no small undertaking, but um, it was a huge win, actually, for us. We had never made our site responsive before. This was our solution to that. And actually, we saw that that drove user engagement. We experienced a 35% increase in user uh, subscription rate because of that. And uh, mobile web actually became our second highest performing platform across the site. So that was pretty huge. And the final problem is the backslide. How do you maintain accessibility on the site? Now that we've made all these changes, every time you create a new feature, how do you prevent those from being inaccessible? And that's a big problem. That's an ongoing problem that we're still trying to fix. We've tried, we're implementing a lot more automated testing around accessibility to make sure that all of the screen readers and everything are still being able to process the page in a predictable way. And we build accessibility principles into every stage of our development, from design to dev to our QA process. Uh, so, uh, this will all be turned into a Medium article within the next month or so, so you will have access to all those code snippets if you need to use them on your site. There are also a lot more, maybe better tools out there that will help you manage your focus. There's a Launchy, which is an accessible modal window that, that you can just kind of plug and play into your own site and use, and a lot more. Like, accessibility is becoming a bigger and bigger deal Obviously, as everything shifts towards the web, we want to make sure that people don't get left behind uh, and that they can continue to access the same amount of information that everyone accesses as well. So go forth, make your site accessible. It opens up great opportunities for new and existing users, not just those with visual impairments, but like I said, making our site responsive was one of the best things we did because now people don't have to download the app to be able to use Scribd. Uh, our colors are better, everyone loves the new branding, we increased our web user sign-up rate by 35%, and you make sure your app is accessible for all types of users. That's also an untapped market for a lot of people. And if that doesn't convince you to make your site accessible, know that if you do, you won't get sued. So, <laughs> do it! Uh, it's better for everybody, and also, Script is hiring, so if you are a developer, either front-end, back-end, ops, or anything, Feel free to come talk to me. I have a bag of swag here. Uh, or you can email me for a referral. And I'm happy to talk with anybody about what we've done at Scribd and what we will continue to do moving forward. So thank you very much. Thank you, Sue. I want to ask you one quick question. Oh, sure. How did you test? How do we test accessibility? Yeah. Yeah. So what we did was we created a test suite for our QA servers, when, and basically it will launch the site onto a headless browser, and then we have tests that use jQuery that basically check like, are there visually hidden spans that like say this stuff, or um, there's also some extensions you can plug into Chrome that test color contrast and things like that, and will tell you if your site does not meet accessibility standards. So we use that tool a lot as well. Thank you. Yeah.